Welcome to the Café Culture podcast, a season of discussions on culture, politics, philosophy and science. The following podcast was recorded on the 17th of September 2012. This week we'll hear from Paul Callahan, member of the Northern Economic Futures Commission. Paul will ask us, is the North-South divide a myth or reality? We're delighted that Paul is here to talk to us this evening on the issue of the North-South divide, myth or reality. Paul has uh, a very diverse uh, background and biography, uh, which makes him very well placed to talk about this. Uh, He is one of the region's leading businessmen. He's chairman of the Leighton Group, which is a software and technology group in, in Sunderland. Uh, he's also the former chair of One North East, the regional development agency, which until recently uh, was responsible for economic growth and development in the North East of England. Uh, he's also the current chair of Sunderland University and also Live Theatre. And uh, the other uh, connection between IPPR North and Paul is that he is currently um, a commissioner on IPPR North's Northern Economic Futures Commission, which is looking at what a growth strategy for the north of England over the next 10 years should look like, and it's something I expect that Paul may talk about a little in his remarks. So the things we've asked Paul to talk about this evening is, what is it about the north that makes us different? What is, is there a case for northern exception? No, what is it? Uh, is it true that it's grim up north? That, that is what the sort of... Uh, this kind of classic media representation of the north of England, but how do you believe? What evidence is there for that? But most importantly, what is the economic potential of the north of England, and what might a strategy for growth look like? And that really is the main meat of the discussion that we want to have with you this evening. So without further ado, I shall hand over to Paul, other than to just say one thing, which is that we're going to be podcasting Paul's uh, contribution this evening. I think there's someone here who's in charge of the podcast and sound levels. Are the sound levels okay for you? I've got the thumbs up. So without further ado, I shall hand you over to Paul. Thanks very much. Well, good evening. Uh, What a wonderful turnout. Thank you very much. If I'd known, we would have got uh, Hall 1 at the Sage. Uh, It it is my first event here, so I didn't really know what to expect. Um, But it's it's great, and I apologise to those of you who don't have a seat. Thanks to you who have come uh, from near and far. Some, some friends here who have come from, from the south of England, and it's delightful to see everyone here. Um, as, as Katie has said, what I, what I propose to do is to talk for 15, 20 minutes, really to give us a few um, hangers on which to develop the arguments. I'm going to talk really about the north-south, uh, is it a divide or is it not a divide, under about 10 different headings. Um, and you'll see them as you go through, so you'll almost be able to tick them off. I'll tell you what number I'm up to, which is always handy because you get bored, you think, well, there's only another three to go. <laughs> um, and then we'll perhaps come back to some of them, the more interesting ones, the more controversial ones, once we get into, into debate. Um, I was just thinking as, as I was um, coming here tonight, um, about ten years ago, at, uh, at a conference at the, uh, the Hilton in Gateshead, I was second up to speak about the state of the region. Now you have to remember this is 2002. And I had, four, had uh, sight of the first speaker's slides before I actually had to speak. And he was an eminent economist. I'm an economist. He was an eminent economist, much more eminent than I am, from Newcastle University, from Kurds, the Centre for Urban and Regional Development Studies. And his opening slide said, if you look at the Northeast economy, the prospects are bleak. This is 2002. The prospects are bleak. And in his opening presentation, he went on to identify why, 10 years ago, the prospects were, in his view, extremely bleak. This was an extremely pessimistic view from an eminent economist. Luckily, having had foresight of this, my opening line was, um, I don't do bleak anymore. I've done bleak. We've done bleak in the 1980s. We did bleak when the shipyards closed, when the pits closed, when unemployment was at record levels, when the attitude of the North was one of despair and acceptance. And by 2002, 
what I said was, we are going to change things. And we are changing things. And I pointed that at that point to things like uh, the Sage and to Sage. We had the biggest software company in the country, which had been the fastest growing business in the UK during the 1990s, and had then sponsored one of the great concert halls of the country. I pointed to Nissan, who at that point weren't even achieving the magnificent output figures and the productivity levels that they're achieving now. And I talked about a number of other things that were in the process of happening. And at the time, I wasn't on the RDA, I wasn't on the Regional Development Agency, but I was involved in trying to change the economy and the society in which I lived, in which my family lived, my friends, my community was. And I think actually, when you look at the numbers, and I say I'm an economist, I'm not going to talk a lot of numbers, but if you actually look at the numbers, that period from 2002 to about 2008, that six year period, was quite dramatic. Because in that period, we not only made the public changes, the great buildings, the public spaces, the renaissance of the northern cities, we also made the big differences economically which had really started to change the way the economy of the North and the Northeast worked. We'd suddenly started to get an entrepreneurial spirit. One of the things that characterizes London and the Southeast is the number of people who want to run their own businesses, who believe that they can be successful entrepreneurs. If you live in the East End of London, no doubt you went to school with somebody who's a multimillionaire. Maybe some who are not multimillionaires. But up here, we had no real entrepreneurial culture. We had a few examples. And we said we're going to encourage those. We're going to act as role models, as mentors, as people who will go out and say, you can do this. And that happened. And what we'd also do is we would change, we would change the sorts of industries that we had. The North, and this is not just the Northeast, but the whole of the North, was the economy of the North was established on the premise of certain key industries. The Northeast, it was essentially coal mining and shipbuilding. And that's why, that was the raison d'etre for our communities and the development of our economy. They'd gone. They'd been there for hundreds of years, and almost in the blink of an eye, they'd been closed, or they had gone into, into ultimate decline. So by 2002, we built no more ships. The Weir, the, the, the river in which I was born, when I was born in 1952, the greatest shipbuilding river in the world. By 2002, not a ship. The coal mines, the biggest deposit of coal anywhere in the UK and one of the biggest in Europe, no longer. So in the blink of an eye, economically, all that changed. And so what we had to do was to bring new industry forward, to see where our strengths, where our potential lay. And we did. We did. In that 10-year period, Nissan, as an example, now produces almost half of the cars produced in the UK. 25 years ago, there was no cars produced in the Northeast. Now, this year, Nissan will produce 500,000 cars out of a total of 1.2 million. And by next year, it will be the only car plant in Europe producing fully electric vehicles. Why? Because the Japanese parent company believe that the people of the Northeast are hardworking, committed, innovative, and can actually produce things. We can make things. I'm a Macam. I make things. Yeah. But we did that in lots of other things. We suddenly started to understand the importance of the weightless economy. What do I mean by the weightless economy? Most, most economies of the world have developed because you needed either to be close to a market, because you produced things and sold it into the market, or close to your raw materials. That was how industry and that was how sectors developed. The Northeast was close to rivers for ships, it was close to the coal or the raw materials which we then shipped out. But in the last 20 or 30 years, particularly since the digital revolution, the knowledge industry is weightless. 
Now, weightless, I mean, it actually has no physical weight. And so suddenly, industries could start to emerge which could sell their products as easily in Australia as they could in Sunderland. They could reach a global market. And so therefore, you started to look at those industries which were built around clusters of knowledge, innovation, universities. And that's what we started to do. And in 2003, One Northeast published a strategy for the Northeast, which was called the Strategy for Success, which put the universities, the five universities, at the heart of the Northeast economy. And here in Newcastle, what we see is the emergence of Science City, the biotech industry, the relationships with the health service, the relationships with the Centre for Life. And so Newcastle has become not just a national centre, but an international centre in the study of, uh, of medicine and in, in the new medicines. And the, um, what I'm particularly pleased about, they're studying um, uh, aging. So I'm getting on a bit, so I want them to actually come up with uh, cures and ways of extending my life. And those sort of things, software, my own business. My own business, we now have the fastest growing software sector outside London from a, a standing start. So in that period, we managed to change things. And then what happened? 2008, the world closed down around us. Started, as somebody said, with Northern Rock. Didn't actually, it started in the States. It just was the first, the first um, images that appeared on our screen were people standing waiting for Northern Rock. It wasn't up here. It was actually in the States where the economy started, uh, the, the capitalist um, model that was in, in operation started to disintegrate. But very quickly, very quickly, in about 18 months, all of the big steps forward that the North, and not just the Northeast, but the whole of the North, had been able to make over that previous eight or ten years suddenly started to, to falter. People stopped buying cars. Nissan went on to short time. They closed one of their shifts. Um, software became more difficult. You couldn't raise the money to actually launch a software <laughs> business. Um, all of the things on which we built that strategy for success started to become shaky. And so here I am tonight, having read in The Economist this weekend, if you're an economist reader, I'm an economist who doesn't like The Economist, <laughs> you read that, that there is a real, um, an article which actually, it says exactly what that economist said 10 years ago. The outlook for the North is bleak. It does it in very stark terms. It says that our future is now of a, uh, a region in decline, with little political clout, with little ambition. And what I want to try and do today, in 15 minutes, 10 minutes, is to challenge some of those. Some of them, some of the views that they have are true. Some of the positions that we have in the North are quite grim. But there are many, many beacons of light, both socially, culturally, economically, politically, on which we can build in the same way as we did 10 years ago, came back from the position that we were then into the next decade. I said I was going to do 10 things. Let's get into those 10 things. The first one, the North-South divide. Is it perception? Is it really just what people think? And I, th I thought I'd just actually, if I don't mind, I'm, I'm going to quote somebody. And it's, uh, I, don't use, I usually quote academics and politicians. I'm going to quote Stuart McConey, who is the writer and disc jockey, and a bit of a professional northerner who lives in the South, who wrote a lovely book called Pies and Prejudice. And he, his, his, argument, oops, his argument was, there's no South of England. There's a bottom half of England. <laughs> but there isn't a South in the same way that there's a North. There's, n there's no conception of the South comparable to the North. Good or bad, the North means something to all English people, wherever they hail from. To Southerners, it means 
desolation, Arctic temperatures, mushy peas, a cultural wasteland with limited shopping opportunities, and populated by aggressive trolls. <laughs> to the north, to northerners, it means home, truth, beauty, valor, romance, warm and characterful people, real beer, and decent chip shops. <laughs> and it is. When, in, one of, in many, many roles that I've had as an employer, trying to attract people to come and work here in the northeast, in the north, if people have never been to the north, if they have no connection to the north, didn't go to school here, didn't have a relative here, never been here on holiday, then they perceive a job in the north as being a leap into the unknown. And there is a, there, there's a concept which we call partner drag, you ever heard of this one? <laughs> partner drag. It's when they go home to their partner and say, hurrah, I've just got a job in Sunderland. And they say, you know, you're well. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the perception is there. So, what do we try to do? Well, if you've got a product which has a poor perception, people think badly about your product, what you do is you try to change the brand. Brand enhancement. And one of the things that I talked about was the economy, but another thing that we talked about was the image. And we introduced in 2006 a regional image campaign called Passionate People, Passionate Places. And it was an idea which was conceived here, which said, let's not compare ourselves with the South. Let's just actually look at what our inherent values are. What do, what are we, what are we proud of? How do we see ourselves? And that's what we put out. And it became a universally successful campaign, picked up by people who wanted to be associated with that brand. Funnily enough, it's still there. We, don't, we haven't spent any money on it for years. But I stopped at a, I stopped at a traffic lights the other day. And I looked, looked to my right, and there's a white van parked me. And it says, passionate about double glazing. <laughs> and you've seen it, haven't you? You've seen passionate about things, and people are passionate. And it wasn't passionate about football. It wasn't passionate about you know going out on a Saturday night. It was passionate about what you were passionate about. Whether you're passionate about culture, passionate about your business, passionate about your family. And so what we try to do is change perception. I don't know whether that perception has changed, and I want to throw that one into the mix. Second thing I'd like to talk about, or just to, to put out there, as soon as I stood up tonight, as soon as I stood up tonight, you knew I was a northerner. I might be a posh macken, but you can tell I'm from Sunderland, or at least I'm from the northeast, because I say film and I say bath. And I, when I stand up to speak, I sound like somebody who was born and brought up in this region. And I have an ear for this sort of thing, and if I heard each of you, I could say, actually, you come from Hartlepool, and you come from Teesside, and you are clearly from South Shields. Because the regional differences are maybe relatively small, but they are distinctive. And in the South, we don't have that, by and large. In London, you may have a North London accent, Estuary English. But essentially, for most of the South, there is pronounced, there is, um, should I say, um, received pronunciation. People speak the same. They speak the same whether they live in Reading or whether they live in Cambridge. Roughly. But here in the north we are very much um, delineated by where we come from and the language. And unfortunately northeast accents have a particular connotation. You're either a footballer or a comic, or you might be an actor, but you're certainly not the Prime Minister. If you talk broad joy, you are not going to end up being the newsreader in Radio F Now, what does that mean? It means something about other people's perception of us. I don't judge somebody's ability and talent and intelligence by their accent. I believe in what they do and what they say, not how they say it. But the rest of the country I think tends to, and which is why many people who leave the region suddenly come back for the holidays and you think, have they been to elocution lessons? 
there is nothing like it. And this hit me, my first day, first day at university, first, not the first day, but first term at university, I went to LSE. So I went, I went down south to London. And I'm doing economics, and I gave my first um, seminar paper. And I worked really hard, I was a SWOT. I got good grades, I was gonna do really well. And I did my paper and read my paper out to the seminar group. And I can still remember the, the lecturer said, his opening line was, you're a Geordie, aren't you, Mr. Callaghan? <laughs> so it wasn't actually about the quality of the argument. His immediate first thing was, you're a Geordie, aren't you? And I said, yes, I am. We were all Geordies in those days. We weren't Magnus. <laughs> but this, this, this is a thing. And we're going to have to move on, because I want to get time for people to speak. <laughs> and I'm getting short. <laughs> Culture. We're all cultural, you know, well, cu there's no culture in the North. There's no culture. Look at what's happened in the North, particularly in these twin cities. Newcastle Gateshead, or as we called in Sunderland, Greater Gateshead. <laughs> <laughs> you, 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 you have a local authority who has decided, in, particularly in Gateshead, that actually the driver for its economy for people to live there is all to do with, well, one of the, the drivers, is to do with culture. And suddenly, in 10 years, my first job was in, in Gateshead, 1974, it used to be a joke. What's the difference between Gateshead and Yogurt? Huh. Yogurt has live culture. <laughs> <laughs> now, the Turner Prize comes. We have the Sage. We have the Newcastle Gateshead cultural venues. I'm, I'm, I'm chairman of, of live theatre. Ten percent. We account for two percent of the population. Townside accounts for two percent of the population. Yet we got twelve percent of the Arts Council budget. They didn't do it because they were kind to us. They did it because they regarded what was coming out of the north, the cultural output that's coming out of the north, as being so significant that we funded it. So let's talk about whether we are a cultural desert anymore, or whether we're actually we're pushing the boundary. Moving on quickly, number four, education. We're all uneducated here, aren't we? We have the lowest uh, percentage of people with grade four or above. Lowest percentage of people with degrees in any region of the country. This is true. We are badly educated at that level. But what we do have is the highest percentage of 16-year-olds coming out of school with five GCSEs, including English and Maths. So at that level, we're addressing that. We're actually starting to bring our next generation through as highly qualified, almost to compensate for the fact that our generation is less qualified. We'll talk about education. Five universities, all good universities, all with a challenge to actually impact on the region and the economy. Health. Uh, you might not believe this, but I'm, I'm over 55. <laughs> and I have a 20% chance, 20% more chance of dying before I'm 75 than if I lived in the south of England. Irrespective of my class, I have a 20% greater chance of dying before I'm 75. What's that about? Is it to do with my genes? Is it to do with my upbringing? Is it to do with my lifestyle? Our problem up here is a problem which is actually being exacerbated. The government is just changing the way the health service is being funded. This is very important if you're, if you're not aware of this. At the moment, the, the government funds health based on health needs. Right? So the more ill people you have, the more funding you get. What it's doing now, it's going to change it to the more old people you have, the more funding you get. Now what that actually means is, if you live longer, you get more money. If you have more illnesses and die earlier, the region gets less money. So have we got a divide here? Have we got a divide which is going to be exacerbated by that? Um, number six. In 2008, we had 4% unemployment in this region. 
this was almost exactly the same as the national average, 4%. We had 48,000 people unemployed in the Northeast. Since the recession, since the austerity program, that has more than trebled. We now have 12% unemployment in the Northeast. We expect unemployment to go from 48,000 in 2008 to nearly 200,000 by the time we reach 2015. Now clearly, what that tells me is 150,000 shirkers, people who clearly are, uh, would prefer to be on the dole than work, people who are sitting around doing nothing, just being benefit scroungers. Or does it? Because that is how unemployed people are being portrayed. What we've seen is a large public sector accounting for 25% of our regional economy, cut to 20%. 5% of the economy made unemployed in a stroke. Why is it impact on us more than anybody else? Because the policy had been to move government jobs to the northeast to try and compensate for the loss of the heavy industry jobs that we had. We were a victim of the success in creating public sector jobs. Output and product productivity. The Northeast, and I say I'm an economist, but I'm not going to talk too much economics. GVA, <coughs> gross value added. Gross value added is the measure of a region's economic output. And if you take the average of the country is 100, the Northeast is at about 79. So 21% behind the rest of the country in terms of productivity. This is terrible. The Northeast must be hopeless. Well, every other region in the country, bar London and the southeast, has a below 100% GVA. Every, we are the most unbalanced country in Europe in terms of output and productivity. The southeast, London, has a GVA in excess of 150. The southeast has a GVA in excess of 135. Even in the northeast, we will have places like Newcastle, who in parts of Newcastle we have a GVA of 120, go to Gosforth, would go down to the East Durham coal fields, their GVA is in the 60s and has not moved since the closure of the pits. So much of the improvements that we made are not reflected in the economic structure that I'll come back to that one. I've got two minutes. <laughs> Delete <laughs> minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Minus 10. Um, investment. Investment. Do we need to put more money in here? Do we just, is, are we going to government and saying, look, we are, we are failing, give us money. Begging bowl. Absolutely not. That was perhaps the view of the 1970s and 80s. We are a poor region. What we need is we need some government money. We need the South. No. We're talking about now investment in those industries in that diversification of an industrial base which will benefit not only the Northeast with its jobs and its prosperity, but will benefit the country as a whole. The only way that this country can get back on track is, as the government said when they came in, a rebalancing, a rebalancing away from the financial markets, the dependence that the South, Southeast has on the city of London and start making things again whether we're making cars or high-tech engineering, or we're making the wind turbines that will actually produce the energy revolution, the green revolution that's to come. So we're not, no begging bowls here, but systematic, planned, strategic investment, which is what we will do to regenerate the northern economies and also to benefit the country as a whole. Number nine, two to go. Innovation. Well, we're not very clever up here, are we? Well, it's interesting that so many innovations, developments are coming out of the north, particularly in things like low carbon economy, offshore wind, undersea developments, software, high tech engineering. They're coming out of our businesses and our universities. And we've got to get behind that because if we don't become an innovative economy, then we will always be undercut by an overseas economy who will give cheaper labor. 
we've got to be smarter, not just uh, work harder. Finally, governance, governance and leadership. One of the problems that the North has at the moment is that we don't have enough recognized leaders, either politically or economically. We don't have a voice for the North. We don't have people who will argue our case, not just in Westminster, but globally in Europe. And what, we, what we've got is a situation that under this current government, many of the devolved regional powers that we had, the RDA, uh, government office, have now been taken back to the centre. Investment decisions are made in Whitehall. Uh, decisions, uh, for instance, I, I was at a meeting with the research councils, research council, university research council, I'm chair of the university, and I was asking them where they're going to put their substantial billions of pounds worth of research. And he said, well, actually, money's getting tight, so we're going to concentrate on where we've always put our money. In fact, we're going to put more money into those, uh, those universities that we have the most confidence in. What he meant was the Golden Triangle. London, Oxford, and Cambridge will actually get more of the pot that's reducing. And I said, well, what about Newcastle and Durham and Sunderland? He said, oh, he said, um, we're geographically agnostic. <laughs> That's what he said. We're geographically, research has got nothing to do with regional policy. Research has got to do with getting the best research. Well, of course, if that's where the research is, you put more min money into it, and you don't give any money to the researchers in other places, that will just exacerbate the problem. So, we're not here asking for a regional government. I think we went down that route with the Prescott uh, experiment, whether you voted for it or against it. We're not sitting here saying, give us a regional assembly. But what we are saying is that the situation of the Northeast and the North as a whole is significantly different economically, perhaps not culturally, perhaps not in terms of how we live. But we need to have a greater degree of autonomy in how we set our own future. We want to be able to drive our own direction we want to be able to identify the industries and the culture that we want, and we want to have that here in the North. So is there a divide between North and South? In some respects, clearly there is. But in many respects, there isn't. But perception says that there is. And what we're saying is, give us a go, give us some more uh, independence. What I'm saying, give us a little bit more autonomy. Give us the ability to actually raise money ourselves, spend money ourselves, attract investment ourselves, make our own future. And the benefit will not just be to the people of the Northeast, but it will be to the country as a whole. Agriculture Northeast is supported by Newcastle University, Peels, and the British Science Association. We're also supported by Ginger's Cafe in Dunn City, who host the events.